Welcome to the fifth and final episode in a Legendarium series about the Roman Apocalypse. In Part 5, End of the Empire, we will talk about how the migrations into Rome led to the rise of barbarian warlords who could install or remove emperors as they saw fit. A Roman commander named Odoacer made one final attempt to revive Roman power, only to be destroyed at the Battle of Placentia. After the death of Ricimer in 472, the splintering of the empire continued until Rome ruled only Italy, southern Gaul, and parts of Illyria. The great landowners who ruled vast estates from villas saw that Rome would not save them. So they made their own agreements with the barbarian warlords, sometimes intermarrying with them to save their estates and make peace with the invaders. The migratory nations adopted a veneer of Romanization. They had Roman titles, they worshipped Christ alongside their father's gods, and presented themselves as Romans. But in practice, they remained faithful to the old ways, not Rome. Instead of Roman law, there was now trial by ordeal. Instead of grand villas, kings lived in timber halls. Instead of Roman military discipline, barbarian armies fought in shield walls. As the migratory nations wrenched one province after another away from Rome, it lost tax revenues along with territory. The army went unpaid, roads and canals fell into ruin, and cities fell into disrepair. People fled towns for the countryside, but found that the country could not support everyone coming in. A traveler would have seen starving children and hordes of beggars tramping the roads. Romans used to ruling the world suddenly found themselves answering to barbarians they once barely deigned to spit on. One such Roman was Orestes, who lived in the province of Pannonia, modern-day Hungary, when the emperor ceded it to the Huns as part of a peace agreement. Able to read and write, the cultured Orestes became Attila's secretary. He lived in the Hunnic capital on the Danube River, where Attila built Roman-style baths and palaces. Some years after Attila's death, Orestes returned to Rome. Like many of his time, Orestes refused to believe that Rome could truly fall. As long as an emperor wore the purple and the walls stood around Rome, the empire lived. But with tax revenues collapsing, Rome relied more and more on barbarian mercenaries who defended the remnants of the empire in exchange for land. With the death of the barbarian emperor-maker Ricimer, his nephew Gundabad the Burgundian took command of the Roman military. In 473, Gundabad followed his uncle's example by installing a puppet emperor named Glycerius. Though the Senate approved Glycerius, the once august body became little more than a rubber stamp for barbarian warlords. Rome itself was largely abandoned. Once a city of one million people, it was now home to 50,000. Whole neighborhoods were abandoned, and vast tracts of once prime real estate turned into farmland. When given the purple cloak and laurel wreath, Emperor Glycerius was hailed not by senators and legionaries, but mainly by Turkic and Germanic mercenaries. Among them was a warrior named Otto Acer, who served in the Imperial Guard. In the past, Rome integrated barbarians like Odoacer by having them serve in the Roman army to learn law and Latin. Now Gundabad's Burgundians remained thoroughgoing Germans. Emperor Glycerius also made Orestes a legate, or general, in the Roman army, but Orestes found himself spending most of his time making peace among the rival barbarian tribes who now made up the Roman army. Sensing the desperation of Rome's situation, Orestes hoped that salvation would come from the aging Emperor Leo of the East Roman Empire. Both to extend his influence and install better leadership, Emperor Leo appointed one of his loyalists, Julius Nepos, as the next emperor of Rome. 
In 474 AD, Nepos led an East Roman army towards Rome to take power. Refusing to leave, Emperor Glycerius ordered Orestes and Gundabad to push Nepos back into the sea. However, King Gundabad simply voted with his feet and returned home to Burgundy, taking most of the Roman army with him. That left Orestes with a ragtag band of Herulians, Rugians, and Scyrians, mostly migrants from eastern Germania. In a desperate bid to preserve what remained of the Western Empire, Orestes persuaded Glycerius to surrender to Nepos, thus sparing the empire another civil war. In turn, Nepos allowed Glycerius to live out his days as a bishop. After being acclaimed emperor, both Odoacer and Orestes proclaimed their loyalty to Emperor Julius Nepos. In turn, Nepos appointed Odoacer and Orestes as co-commanders of his legions, hoping to appease both Romans and barbarians. This came as a great shock to Orestes, who hoped to make Rome Roman again. But the two commanders soon faced a new challenge in King Uruk of the Visigoths, who snatched one Roman province in Transalpine Gaul after another until nothing remained except a strip of land on the coastline. Julius Nepos sent Orestes and Odoacer west to force Uruk to leave. Perhaps sensing that they were being sent on a suicide mission, Orestes instead convinced Odoacer to join him in overthrowing Julius Nepos. Once he saw the army coming to Rome instead of Gaul, Nepos fled to the port city of Ravenna. Barbarian troops tore the city apart, looking for an emperor who already fled. Until his death in 480 AD, Nepos called himself the Emperor of Western Rome. Meanwhile, it fell to Orestes to actually restore Roman glory. Fearing that Rome's aristocracy would not trust a man who spent most of his career in the Hunnic court, Orestes appointed his 12-year-old son Romulus Augustulus as emperor. It is a historic irony that the final emperor of Rome bore the name of Rome's founder Romulus and its first emperor Augustus. In return for his support during the coup, Odoacer demanded one-third of the land in Italy as payment. Knowing this land to be settled by Roman citizens and owned by Roman magnates, and aware that this would deprive the empire of yet more tax revenue, Orestes refused. When Odoacer's barbarian army learned of this, they rose up within their army camp and Orestes had to flee for his life. With no regrets, the barbarians offered Odoacer the kingship of Italy if they led him in taking the remnants of the empire. Eager for revenge, Odoacer raided the towns of Italy in days and days of brutal plundering. These unpaid barbarians could be compared to soldiers who missed several paydays and found themselves starving. Once wealthy Romans lost everything in walls of flame and smoke. Orestes fled into northern Italy while leaving his son Romulus Augustulus in Ravenna. Orestes sought refuge in a church, but Odoacer and his men ransacked the holy places, even stealing the alms money collected by the bishop before burning the churches of Ravenna. Fleeing once more, Orestes continued fleeing across the north of Italy before Odoacer finally caught up with him at the city of Placentia. A terrible battle followed. It would have been a horrifying experience, having to fight for one's life among the screaming wounded, climbing over dead bodies to reach the enemy, and battling through the stench of injured men emptying their bladders and bowels. Though Rome had already fallen, Orestes refused to admit defeat and eventually died in combat. Orestes marched into Ravenna, intending to make himself king of Italy. The boy emperor Romulus Augustulus was protected only by his uncle Paulus, who fought to the death while his nephew fled deeper into the palace. In a pitiful end for mighty Rome, the last emperor hid under a table as howling barbarians tore the palace apart searching for him. 
After capturing him, Ottoacer decided to spare the boy, in part to endear himself to his new subjects. Ottoacer ultimately pensioned off Romulus Augustulus and gave him a villa to live in. However, Ottoacer ordered the orphaned boy emperor to send the imperial regalia to Constantinople, along with a letter saying that another emperor would not be needed in the West. In the summer of 476 AD, Ottoacer was proclaimed King of the Barbarians in Italy. By this act, Ottoacer effectively ended the Roman Empire. Instead of an emperor, a king would reign. Romulus Augustulus himself would live quietly in his villa until his death sometime around 509 AD. Unlike the Romans, Ottoacer kept his promises. He granted land to the families of his men. Homesteads began to pop up. Some Roman aristocrats made peace with the new arrivals, others saw their estates carved up and themselves reduced to poverty. Ottoacer himself ruled nominally as a client to the East Roman emperors, but they did nothing to help him when the Ostrogoths moved into Italy and eventually conquered and killed him in 493 AD. The fall of Rome is the most important political event in Western history. Without the shattering of the empire, the Romanized populations of Europe, Africa, and Asia would not have developed separate identities. Instead of speaking French, Spanish, English, and Portuguese, there would have been Latin-speaking Romans in all these countries, speaking a language close to modern Italian. This Neo-Roman homeland would have included Britain, North Africa, and the south bank of the Danube. A single ethnic group with a common religion and language would have inhabited all the lands from Britain to Southwest Asia. It would have rivaled China as the most ancient and populous country on Earth. Indeed, it is worth remembering that China split up and collapsed into anarchy several times in its history only to reunite. It could have happened with Rome. Indeed, China absorbed and assimilated non-Chinese invaders on multiple occasions. At the height of the Roman Empire, about 60 million people lived and died under the rule of the emperors. During the Great Collapse, the population fell by more than half, bottoming out at around 20 million people in 600 AD. Far more died from famine and disease than from war. The European population would not recover until well into the medieval warm period, around 1000 AD. That wraps things up for this Legendarium series. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me. I hope that you have a great rest of the day.